In previous videos, we discussed three different situations in which porous materials suffer frost damage, trapped water, hydraulic pressure, and crystallization pressure. In this video, we examine the case where a pool of water freezes on a horizontal surface and leads to our case 4 of freezing damage, referred to as salt scaling. Horizontal surfaces of porous materials exposed to freezing, such as concrete sidewalks or roads, get more extensively damaged if a layer of water accumulates on top of them and freezes. In such horizontal elements, one generally sees a loss of the cementitious matrix, leaving the aggregates visible. In such cases, the damage is known to increase when the depth of the freezing water increases. As shown in this graph, the mass loss is greatest for the thickest layer, zero without the liquid layer, and intermediate otherwise. Damage is exacerbated in concrete prepared with a high water to binder ratio, which leads to lower tensile strength and higher porosity. Surface damage can result from abrasion, bursting of water-filled air voids as they freeze, or crystallization pressure in pores near the surface. However, the main cause of superficial frost damage results from a phenomenon historically known as salt scaling. The name comes from the observation that small amounts of salt in the freezing layer increase the damage. This is shown here for calcium chloride, where damage worsens up to concentrations of about 3%. Beyond that point, the damage decreases again as the salt concentration increases. Such situations are defined as having a pessimum, meaning a worst-case scenario exists with respect to the salt concentration. The situation is quite similar with sodium chloride, but also with urea and ethanol. However, these compounds are chemically very different, Calcium chloride and sodium chloride are salts highly soluble in water, urea is an amide, and ethanol is an alcohol. Therefore, the origin of the mechanism explaining the salt scaling cannot be of chemical nature. The explanation proposed finds its origin in a thermal dilatation mismatch between the ice layer and the concrete. After freezing and as temperature decreases, both the concrete and the ice layer tend to shrink, but the ice layer contracts five times more because of its much higher thermal dilatation coefficient. Let us simply consider the ice layer. If left alone, its free shrinkage upon cooling would be substantial. However, being bound to the thicker concrete, the ice layer is restrained from shrinkage and finds itself in tension. At low stresses, the ice deforms elastically, but does not crack. Above a certain level of stress, however, the ice will crack perpendicularly to its surface, and the crack will extend into the surface of the concrete. A similar process is used in decorating glass where a layer of epoxy is applied hot to a heated glass. It is then allowed to harden before being cooled down. The higher contraction of the epoxy upon cooling causes it to crack. At a certain depth, the crack turns and peels a chip of glass from the surface. This chipping or spalling process is strictly analogous to the cracking of ice on concrete so we can refer to the salt scaling mechanism as glue spall. In concrete, it should be noted that the cracks are also deflected by the weak interface around the harder aggregates. The spalling mechanism also explains the pessimum. Indeed, low level of contaminants create brine droplets that act as floors in the ice layer, making it easier for the ice to crack. So, for low contamination levels, increasing the contaminant dosage increases the damage. On the other hand, too many such defects weaken the ice layer too much 
and reduce the elastic energy that can build up upon cooling and before cracking. Therefore, beyond the pessimum, the cracking releases less energy, so damage decreases as the contamination level continues to increase. Interestingly, air entrainment also reduces the damage in salt scaling. Going back to our previous cases, the extent of damage for the same number of cycles, 50, is substantially reduced when an air entrainer is added when preparing concrete. Nevertheless, a large number of cycles, here 200, leads to damage. In salt scaling, the effectiveness of air entrainment is understood to originate from the ability of air voids to nucleate ice, which we also saw to be at the origin of their beneficial effect against crystallization pressure. Water is pushed into the air voids by crystals that form in the small pores and freezes in the air voids. The ice thereby nucleated in these voids can grow freely and draws water from the surrounding fine porosity in the cementitious matrix. This leads to a suction in the pores that increases the effective shrinkage strain of concrete as temperature decreases. So, for a given cooling, while the free shrinkage strain of the ice layer will not change, the concrete will shrink more if it contains an air entrainer. Consequently, the differential strain between concrete and ice is reduced and the risk of damage decreases. In conclusion, frost damage on horizontal surfaces of porous materials is enhanced by the presence of a layer of ice. An increased thickness of this layer makes this problem worse, as do small amounts of soluble contaminants independently of their chemical nature. These observations, as well as the beneficial role of air entrainment, are well rationalized by the so-called glue-spall model.